welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to a world where fears and suspense are the order. In cities and towns of North Africa, it's a common sight to see an old man sitting in the public square, surrounded by an admiring crowd who squat on their haunches as they listen to an age-old tale of courage, of romance, but above all, of mystery. Like that old man, the public teller of tales, I have a story for you. A story that takes place in our own country, which deals in matters that defy explanation. Matters which can be explained only from the tomb. What are you doing, you? What are you shooting at? Don't ask questions. Just fire while I reload. Fire? At what? Straight ahead of you, where the grave is moving. You, what are we doing? What is it? You, you saw it this time, didn't you? You saw the movement, the blurry outline of a shape. I saw a movement, but nothing else. Well, where are your eyes, Bill? It was there. You just had a look and you'd have seen it. I think. What the devil are you talking about, you? Seen what? You know, the thing. The damn thing. <laughs> mystery drama, The Damned Thing, was inspired by the celebrated American writer Ambrose Bierce. It was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Robert Dryden and Joan Tompkins. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. By the light of a kerosene lamp placed at one end of a rough wooden table, a tall, gaunt man is reading something written in a book. The man reads silently as his fingers trace the words. As the man lifts the book toward the light, the shadows cast by the ledger throw half of the small room into darkness, obscuring the faces of seven men sitting against the log walls of the little cabin. On the other side sit three people, two women and a man, an elderly Indian, all equally silent, equally motionless. Next to them is an empty chair. By extending an arm, any one of them can touch the man who is lying on the table face upward, covered by a sheet, his arms at his side. The man, Hugh Morgan, is dead. The man with the book is the district coroner. They all seem to be waiting for someone to occupy the empty chair. Finally, the tall man closes the book. There are three things to determine at this inquest. The identity of the deceased, the time of death, and finally the mode of the departure, and the manner in which his life came to an end. There's no question of identity. These have been positively confirmed as the remains of Hugh Morgan, famous scientific book writer and, until three years ago, well-known professor at the State University. Upon resigning from the university, he came up here to our mountains with Mrs. Morgan to get away from city life, to get what he called closer to nature. He built this cabin. Pretty much with his own hands. Is that a fair statement, Ms. Morgan? That's correct, Mr. Bentley. The time of death has been determined by medical examination as between 36 and 48 hours ago. We are now waiting for Mr. William Harker, the young newspaper fellow from San Francisco, former student of Professor Morgan. His testimony, we are led to believe, may be of the greatest importance in this determination. And until such time as he arrives, we shall proceed with the investigation. I first call on the wife, the widow of the demised. Miss Morgan, if you please. Yes. Would you kindly repeat to these gentlemen what you've already told me about how your late husband met his death? 
My husband loved these mountains. Second only to his work, his, his writing. He loved nothing more dearly than walking, hunting, fishing, in all seasons, all kinds of weather. No, of course. Uh, tell us, please, about the visits of young Mr. Harker. Well, as you've already stated, Mr. Harker is a newspaper man, a former student, a, a protege of Professor Morgan's. He had visited with us for a few days five or six weeks ago. You do not like Mr. Harker, do you, Miss Morgan? No, I do not. I have my reasons. Did anything unusual happen during Harker's first visit five or six weeks ago? No, uh, uh, except for the dog. The dog? The hunting dog, Sandy. Professor Morgan and Harker went hunting. Sandy was horribly mutilated by some other animal and he died. I've never seen Harker so upset after all those things happened. And Miss Harker's second visit? Three days ago. There was something he said he wanted to talk to my husband about. Something that had happened on that first visit. It had to do with money. I was in the kitchen. And I distinctly remember hearing my husband say... But, Bill, a debt is a debt. And $5,000 is a lot of money. I know that, you. And if I can nail this story down, write it so it makes sense, so people will believe it, I'll get that 5000 as a bonus. And I'll return it to you. Well, I hope so, Bill. It's been almost four years and we need the money. Trust me. Just help me get this story. Well, I don't know what you expect me to do. All we have to do is go back to where Sandy got hurt. Well, it's one thing for a dog. I suppose, just, just suppose... Stop worrying. What makes you think you can write it so that the paper will take it? With your help, I can do it. Get your gun. I've got it. Is it loaded? Of course. All right, let's go. And the two of them left the cabin, both with loaded guns. Uh, what time of the day was it, Miss Morgan? It wasn't day. It was night. Night before last. Clear, bitterly cold. It was a sharp night. I remember looking out the window after them. They had been gone no more than five minutes when I heard the strangest sound. It's hard to describe to you. And then almost immediately there was a scream. Oh, no. And then two shots, one right after the other. And then, Miss Morgan? A few minutes later, young Harker burst into the cabin looking as if he'd seen a ghost. He could hardly speak. When he was able to catch his breath, he said, Mrs. Morgan, he was dead. Killed. Who killed him, Mr. Harker? I don't know. I was right there. And heaven help me. I don't know. And it's your feeling, Miss Morgan, that... My husband was a big man, sir. A strong man. He played football at college. Wrestling team, too. The only thing he couldn't do was swim. But he was in perfect health. And Mr. Harker's a very slight young man. No match physically for my husband. Which leads you to believe... To do away with Hugh, Harker needed his gun. In other words, you're convinced that the shots you heard... Had to come from William Harker's hunting rifle. A double-barreled gun. Harker's motive being... To wipe out Hugh and his debt to him at the same time. Uh, for the time being, I must ask these gentlemen of the jury to question what you are implying. You see, there is some doubt whether Mr. Harker or anybody else could possibly have shot your husband. Well, why is that? Because the condition of the body is such that at this time we cannot tell whether or not it contains so much as a single bullet wound. I call now on Miss Viola May Atwater. Is that water? Call me Viola May, like everyone else does. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, now, uh, it's been previously established, Miss At. Uh, Viola May, that you work here in the Morgan household? Worked. And your duties were? Keeping the place clean, doing some of the cooking. 
especially when Mrs. Morgan wasn't feeling just right. Oh, driving to town in the wagon for supplies. And... Mm-hmm. Professor Morgan was in love with you, wasn't he? Well, wouldn't exactly call it love. But we did get along quite well. I'd like for you to tell us all how well. I'm going to have Hugh's child. That's how well. Thank you, Viola me. Now, you do understand why we're all here, don't you? Well, I think so. This is not a trial. No one is being accused of anything. Yet. They're just trying to find out the truth. They just want to know what happened night before last. I can tell you. Please do. Well, you know how it was between the professor and me. And for the longest time, he'd been telling me he was going to get rid of Mrs. Morgan some way. But now, she ain't such a fool. She didn't know what was going on. Well, night before last, I was in the kitchen doing the supper dishes. I couldn't help hearing every word they said. How much longer do you think I'm going to put up with this? No one's asking you to put up with anything. A man your age, a man of your reputation, having a sordid affair with a stupid, ignorant girl. Where's your pride? That stupid, ignorant girl is something you never had. That is pretty obvious, dear. I'm talking about things like, like compassion. In her own simple way, she has a, a warmth and a tenderness that you've never shown in all the years of our marriage. And she understands you, doesn't she? You poor miss. And there's something else since you've started. While May is going to have my child. I know. I want that child to have my name. I want a divorce. Simple as that. Simple as that. Before I'd let you throw yourself away on a girl like that, and before I'd let you toss me aside like some old worn-out shoe, I'd kill you first. I'm sure you would. Don't push me to where I'd have to prove it. Excuse me, ma'am. The dishes are done. Kitchen's in order. Is there anything else you'd like me to do before I turn in for the night? That'll be all. Thank you. Well, then I just say good night. Well, Hugh, I'm going for a walk. Around the lake. I'll go with you. <laughs> if you like. After we get back. Pay a visit to your little friend. And they both went out together. Now, what time of the night would you say it was when they left? Oh, 9.30 maybe. 10 at the latest. What would you do after they left? Straighten things up a little more. And then? Well, they wasn't gone very long. Maybe, oh, maybe five minutes. Not more. When I heard a most peculiar sound, like not, nothing I'd ever heard before. I, I can't exactly describe what it was like. And, and then, almost on top of it, there was a scream that went right through it. Go ahead, Barbara May. A minute or two later, Mrs. Morgan bust right into the cabin. She couldn't hardly talk. And finally, she said, Viola May, Mr. Morgan is dead. Drowned in the lake. Mrs. Morgan told you herself that you, uh, Professor Morgan, couldn't swim. Now, I think you gentlemen can see for yourselves what happened. The first chance she got, she pushed him into the lake at the part where it's real deep. Now, he struggled for a piece, and in the darkness of the night, finally give up and drown. I see. As I've explained before, Val May, this inquest has been called because there is reason to believe that Hugh Morgan met his end through some kind of foul play. Like I said. Mm, not quite like you said. Chances of Professor Morgan's death coming about as a result of drowning are very slim. Medical examination of the body thus far shows that the lungs C 
seem to be perfectly normal. No water in them. Not a drop. Absolute truth is a very strange thing. What seems real to one person is very often a lie to another. The fact, as one person sees it, becomes a fiction in the eye of his neighbor. What, then, is real? And at what point does imagination, for example, color reality? I'll return shortly with Act Two. In an isolated cabin high in a deserted area of the mountains of Northern California, a corpse lies cold and rigid on a rough hand-hewn table. The dead man, science writer Hugh Morgan, has come to an unexplained and unnatural end. The district coroner and his jury await the arrival of a man who may turn out to be the key witness in this death. Two other witnesses, the wife and the mistress of the dead man, have already testified. The coroner turns up the wick of the kerosene lamp, calls on a third witness, the elderly Indian, who has been sitting in stony silence, listening. Joe Crowfoot? Yes, sir. Joe, you earn your living as a guy at the hunting parties, is that right? Yes, sir. I know every stream. Every trail, like the back of my hand. Uh -huh. Would you please repeat for the benefit of these gentlemen what you already told me? What happened night before last? It was about 9.30. I'd put out the lamps and was just about to call it a day. Hunting party at 5 the next morning. I'd just gone out to the rear of my shack when I heard voices. You said you loved me, Hugh. You said I was the only thing in this whole wide world that mattered to you. That's true, Viola May. Then what's all this talk you've given out to me about how the time ain't right for a divorce? It would kill her. I may not love her, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to do anything to hurt her. Ain't you the considerate one. You think nothing of hurting me. Look out for that snake. Oh. Quick, get back on the path. <sighs> Well, it was close. I, I couldn't see it. Well, how could you? Here. Here, let's sit down on this stump for a minute and... Uh, uh, say, keep, keep your voice down. Joe's asleep, and we don't want to wake him. you got a responsibility, Hugh. I'm going to be mother to your child. So you say. Now, what's that mean? Well, what makes you so sure it's me? Well, who is the... Now, what is in back of that filthy mind of yours? I told you to keep your voice down. I tell the whole world what a dirty old man you really are. You little fool. Ah. You pull yourself together. You mock him. I hope you... You push me. You deliver. No. Well, the rattlesnake, it's there. I can see it. But don't move. Lie here as quietly as... It's lifting its head, but... It's it bit me. Get help. You little idiot, I've been bitten. Wait, Joe Crowfoot, fast. What makes you think Joe would help you? Wake him up yourself, lover boy. I got more important things to do. Joe! Joe Crowfoot, help! I need help! Help me, somebody! In no time at all. I had him in my shack, did everything I knew to kill the poison the snake had shot into his body. But... Yes, Joe? I guess I was too late. Within a very short time, Professor Morgan was dead. And it is your testimony that he was pushed by the young lady, the Viola May, into the spot, the area... Where she knew there was a rattlesnake. Yes, sir. That's very interesting, Mr. Crowfoot. Why do you say that? The medical examination. As far as we can determine, 
Not a trace of the snake's poison is in the bloodstream. Not a trace. Mr. Bentley, I got here as fast as I could. Uh, you, young man, are... I'm, I'm William Harker of the San Francisco Press. Forgive me if I've held things up. Oh, delighted to see you, Mr. Harker. I left the minute I got your call. Uh, this is not the easiest place to get to. I won't finish this business tonight. Well, I, I think you should know that when I left here early yesterday morning, it was uh, not to evade your summons. No? No, it was uh, to get the story to my paper, the story of Hugh Morgan's death. Now, uh, Mr. Harker, we've heard three different versions tonight of how Hugh Morgan met his death. And none of them has yet been substantiated by the facts of the medical examination of the body. Now, have we any reason to expect that the account you posted to your newspaper, Mr. Harker, will be anything like the story you will give here? That's up to you, sir. I've made a carbon copy of what I wrote for my paper. You're welcome to see it. it, it it's incredible. More incredible than pure fiction. But it is the truth. I'll swear to it. All right, we'll resume the inquest. Mr. Arthur, would you kindly be seated? Now, you knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. Now, where? He was my professor at the university. It taught me everything I knew about writing. More than that. He was the closest friend I had. And you were with him when he died? I was with him when he died. How'd that happen? You being here, I mean. Well, I, I came up three days ago to shoot and fish. Uh, part of my purpose, however, was to follow up on the story of the dog, Sandy. Y you see, I had been here five weeks earlier. On a purely friendly visit to your old teacher? Well, on that occasion, we went out hunting, as we'd usually done on previous visits. It was still dark. The sun had not yet risen when we left the cabin. Sandy! Sandy! Here, boy! Have you any idea where that silly dog went? Well, he was here a minute ago, you. Funny well, thing, he just disappeared. Oh, but he'll be back. In the meantime, we'll have to do without him. Well, now, let's see if we're as good as he is in raising some quail. Uh, what's our best ground? Uh, beyond that ridge, I'd say. We'll have to go through the chaparral to get to it. It's pretty level ground, thickly covered with grain. Uh, let's go, Bill. Hold it, Bill. Hold it. Be very quiet. What is it? Just listen. What is that? I, I think we've startled a deer. Oh, I wish we'd bought a rifle instead of just such. Shh. Be very quiet. What are you doing, you? You're not going to fill up a deer with quail shot, are you? Is anything wrong? You. Have we jumped a grizzly? Cock your gun, Bill. Well, now what? Everything's so quiet. What is it? Just keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. Keep low, very low. And watch. And that's exactly what I did. What happened next? A minute or two went by. Suddenly, there was this weird sound that seemed to come from out of nowhere. It grew louder and louder. It got to the point where I had to put my hands over my ears to shut out the sound. It was so shattering. And then it stopped. As suddenly as it had started. And what did you see, Mr. Hart? Well, up until then, the bushes had been deathly still. Not a bit of movement of any kind. I turned to Professor Morgan and was about to speak when the field of wild oats we'd been watching began to move in the most curious way. It seemed as if the oats were being stirred up by a streak of wind, which, well, not only bent it, but pressed it down, crushed it, so that it didn't rise, as if some huge, invisible, what can I call it, present was moving slowly along through the oats, stepping on it with giant feet. And this movement, foot by foot, was prolonging itself directly toward us. 
What was your feeling, Mr. Hiker, as you were watching this, uh, this strange occurrence? Well, I must confess that I lay there in the chaparral, right beside Professor Morgan, watching this fantastic thing happen, and I, I was not afraid. Was this equally true of your companion? No. He was terrified. What are you doing, Hugh? What are you shooting at? Don't ask questions. Just fire while I reload. Fire? At what? Straight ahead of you, where the grain is moving. Well, if you say so. Hugh, what are we doing? What is it? It's all over now. It's gone. Let's see what happens. Yes. Oh, no. But poor, poor Sandy. Just look at him. Ripped to pieces. As if he'd run into the blades of a, of a, of a threshing machine. But what did it? I, I didn't see anything. Well, you saw the movement, didn't you? And a sort of, a sort of blurry outline of a shape? I saw the movement. Nothing else. Well, where are your eyes, Bill? It was there to see. You just had a look and you'd have seen it. I think. What the devil are you talking about, you? Seen what? The thing. The damned thing. The what? That's what I call it. The damned thing. First, it did away with my chickens, and then the pigs and the cattle. And now poor Sandy slashed to pieces. And that's not the end. Only the good Lord knows what the damn thing will destroy next. Or who? Is it possible that there is a grain of truth in the incredible story Harker has just told? And can Hugh Morgan's fear of a shapeless, sinister force, of a thing that seems to challenge all reason and logic, be justified? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. From the blank darkness outside the cabin come the familiar noises of night in the wilderness. The long, nameless note of a distant coyote. And all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem always to have been but half heard when they suddenly cease. But none of the company present seems to be aware of anything other than the corpse on the table before them. Please continue, Mr. Hart. Well, uh, that's about it. Uh, we buried the dog and went back to the cabin. And I- never said another word to each other about what had happened that morning. You stayed on for a while? Uh, no, sir. I I returned to San Francisco the next day. And then, five, six weeks later, three days ago, you came back again. Why? To fill in some of the blanks. Uh, there were too many unexplained things. Uh, tell us what happened night before last. I think you had a pretty good idea of why I had come back so soon after the episode with the dog. It was he himself who suggested that we go out to hunt whatever might be around. I think our best chances are this way, over this ridge. But, Hugh, isn't that the same ridge where Sandy... Of course it is, of course. Now, just see that your gun is loaded. It's loaded. Good. Keep your eyes and ears open. We've got a full moon and visibility is real good. Now, if anything... Be very quiet, Bill. Do you hear anything? No. Nothing. But just be careful. Be very careful. It comes up on you out of nowhere. It gives you no warning. Right. Let it have it, Bill. Both barrels. And here's mine. I missed it, Bill. I missed it. Run. Run for your life. You, you, you. I don't see anything. What's happened? I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the haze. Something 
soft and heavy, hurled itself against me with great force. Before I could get back to my feet, I heard Morgan crying out in mortal agony. <laughs> mingling, mingling with his cries were hoarse, savage sounds, like from the throats of mad dogs fighting each other to the death, snarling and growling. This time I was terrified. I struggled to my feet. I looked for Professor Morgan and... and and may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that. Ah, no, no, easy, Miss Hart. <laughs> Not twenty yards away, my friend was down on one knee, his head thrown back at a terrifying angle. His, his hat was gone. His long hair was in disorder. His whole body was convulsed with violent movements from one side to the other, backward and forward. His, his right arm... Yes. It was lifted, and it didn't seem to have a hand. At least I could see none. The other arm was completely invisible. Morgan seemed like a, a wrestler of some kind, determined... And yet overcome, beaten by a force of superior weight, greater strength. And all this time, all you saw was Morgan? Yeah. Nothing else? Nobody else? No, just him. And then, not always distinctly. And throughout the whole thing, such sounds of rage and fury as I have never heard in my life, from man or beast. Now... What, if anything, did you do to help your friend? Well, I, I ran toward him. I had a funny kind of feeling that, well, that he was suffering from a fit or from some kind of convulsion. I, I looked up, and by the light of the moon, I, I could see as, as I had weeks before, the same mysterious movement of the wild oats, retreating, rolling itself back from the place where Hugh lay, toward the edge of the woods. When I got there, I, I I looked down at my friend. He was lying on his back, absolutely still and quiet. He was dead. Gentlemen, you've now heard four different accounts from four different witnesses. Now... Finally, there is the version of death in some mysterious manner that Morgan was killed by an unknown force or creature of some kind, which Morgan called the damn thing. Uh, Mr. Bentley, uh, there are two things more I would like to bring to your attention. Yes, Mr. Hark? First, that book you placed under the table, I recognize it as Professor Morgan's diary. You seem greatly interested in it. In fact, you were reading it while I was testifying. M may I see it? I'm sure it would throw a great deal of light on Morgan's death. The book will cut no figure in this matter, Mr. Harker. All the entries in it were made before Hugh Morgan's death. That's ridiculous. Now, you said there's something else you'd like to bring to our attention before a verdict is rendered? Well, there's one substantial bit of evidence which has not yet been revealed. Yes, Mr. Harkin. The body of Morgan. I demand that you uncover the body right now so that we can all see whether or not I was telling the truth. I will be happy to meet with your request, Mr. Harkin. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen of the jury, the body of Hugh Morgan. Now, it may be difficult to see details in this light. I read from the medical report, gentlemen. The body of the demise is covered with broad maculations of bluish black caused by extravasated contusions. Uh, that's those big black and blue marks here and here and over here. The chest and sides appear to have been beaten with some heavy weapon such as a bludgeon. I call your attention 
these huge tears in the flesh where the skin has been ripped in shreds and little strips. And might we know why there's that silk handkerchief passing under the chin and knotted on top of the head? <clears throat> you may indeed. I'll remove it, and I think you'll see why it's there. If it weren't there, the head would almost be separate, detached from the rest of the body. What was once the neck and throat have, as you can see, been chewed away. That satisfy you, Mr. Harker? Thank you very much. Now I will ask the jury to adjourn for its verdict. We, the jury, do find that the remains of Professor Morgan come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion. You can't mean that! But just the same, there is some of us thinks that the remains was subject to a simple case of fits. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Harker. Can't say I'm surprised to see you. To what does my humble office owe the honor of your visit? I, uh, can't accept the verdict your jury gave last night. Unfortunately, there ain't much you can do about it. I think there is, sir. I can establish the truth about Hugh Morgan's death. And how exactly do you propose to do that, Mr. Harker? Take a look at this. What is it? A reel of tape and a recording machine. Months ago, I asked Hugh to make a day-by-day -day recording of whatever he saw, whatever he experienced in connection with this phenomenon. Would you like to hear it, Mr. Coroner? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. This might just possibly make you change your mind. Listen carefully. And Sandy kept running in a kind of half-circle keeping his head turned always toward the center. You recognize that as Professor Morgan's voice? Yes, He I kept do. barking furiously. At last, he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go. At first, I thought maybe he'd gone mad. And then the thought occurred to me, can a dog see with his nose? Can a dog think with his nose? Do odors impress on the brain the image of the thing that gave off the odor? The next entry is a few weeks later. May 27th. It's been here again. I find evidence of its presence every day. In the morning, fresh giant footprints were there as before. I, I find it impossible to sleep. This is terrible and terrifying. If this is real, I shall go mad. And if it isn't real, then I'm mad already. It's like I say. Shh. Just... June 3rd. I will not leave. I will not let it drive me away. This is my house. My land. June 5th. I can't stand it any longer. I've invited Harker to spend a couple of days here with me. He has a level head. I can tell from the way he acts whether or not he thinks I'm insane. Turn it off. I've heard all I intend to hear. Not yet, sir. We're coming to the most important part of the whole thing. Just listen. June 10th. I have it. I'm sure I have it. I have the solution to this mystery. It came to me last night suddenly. And how simple it is. How, how terribly simple. There are sounds we cannot hear. At either end of the scale, there are notes that that imperfect instrument, the human ear, cannot grasp. They're either too high in pitch or too low. Like those whistles that they make for dogs. The dogs can hear it, but the tones are too high for the human ear. Uh, Mr. Hartley, say please. As it is with sounds, so it must be, so it is with colors. Things that are visible to the eye, things that are not visible, are all of them ruled by the same phenomena that govern sounds. At one end of the solar spectrum, there are infrared waves and ultraviolet waves at the other. 
None of them are visible to the human eye. The eye can only see a few octaves of this huge band of colors, the band between the infrared and the ultraviolet. Now I know that I am not mad. There are colors that we cannot see. And heaven help me, the damned thing is of such a color. Well, yes, that's what killed Morgan. I was there. I saw it happen. Mr. Harker, you play this tape for anybody, and they'll swear that Professor Morgan was as crazy as a loon. I don't think you'd want that, would you? What are you going to do? Now, yeah, please have that real tape. Now, I love the truth as well as the next fellow. The world needs the truth. But there are times when the world has an even greater need for what is not true. For the untruth that may offer something like consolation, compassion, or hope. And so, Mr. Harker, with your permission, I think destroying this tape is the best thing we could possibly do. As the last foot of tape turned into ashes, the skies opened up and it began to rain. And the mutilated body of Hugh Morgan rested quietly where it was. They say, blessed is the bride the sun shines on, blessed is the corpse the rain falls on. Who knows? I'll be back in a moment. An interesting footnote on Ambrose Bierce, the American writer on whose story, The Damned Thing, our tale was based. In 1913, he left his work, disappeared into Mexico... And every trace of him was lost forever. Never heard from again. Is it just possible that he, like Hugh Morgan, met his end at the hands of some damned thing? Who knows? Our cast included Arnold Moss, Robert Dryden, Joan Tompkins, E.V. Juster, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Even tricks go wrong sometimes, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, did anything like that ever happen to your husband? Well, yeah, once. He, he couldn't open the lock on his handcuffs. See, he had a key hidden in the cuff of his trousers, but it slipped out of his hand and fell between the cracks of the floorboard. He wasn't hurt or anything. It was just a wicker basket escape on stage. I see. But if anything like that happened now, I mean, uh, at the bottom of a lake. Well, that would be terrible. It would be awful. Yeah. It would be really tragic. I, I don't want to think about it. Any such thing. I, I just don't want to think about it. No, no, no. Of course not, Wanda. At least we won't think about it tonight. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> 